welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome David Willig to the show. He is the founder of American International Sports Management, and he has some interesting things to share with us today about what happens when people play sports overseas, how they can live a jet setter lifestyle, and then we'll talk about business and law in general as it applies to uh, the world of international life. David, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be with you. The pleasure is mine. And you're coming to us today from Miami, Florida. Is that correct? That's correct. Fantastic. How did you happen to found the American International Sports Management Group? Well, you know, it really grew out of uh, a long time of practicing law pretty much around the world. I was an international lawyer for about 25 years. and I had represented athletes here and there uh, once in a while over those years. But I got interested in uh, sports law on a more intensive basis, I guess, about a few years ago. And, you know, as I as I learned more about the field, I came to understand that uh, sports agency has a lot in common with what I've been doing for the past 25 years. And since I was, I have to say, pretty good at what I was doing over the time, I thought I would, I would really be able to have a good impact uh, in the sports agency business, particularly in overseas sports. And and so when athletes are going overseas, I mean, what what type and level of athlete are you are you talking about? Are you are you talking about someone before they get to the pros, or what what are we talking about there? You know, I'm really talking about all those things. It could be a co- college athlete out of college in the United States. You know, they're they're going to have the NBA draft in a few weeks. A lot of those uh, college ball players are hoping to be drafted, but not everyone's going to be. So a good plan B, if you're not drafted in the NBA, is to have contacts to be able to play overseas. As far as levels of play overseas, there are many different levels of play. I wouldn't say that uh, the highest level of play is the same level as NBA, but it is quite competitive in the highest levels, for example, of European basketball. And there are also uh, lower levels of professional basketball in Europe and other countries. So there are, I think, a lot of uh, niche niche places that uh, players can, can get into and, and play professionally without being in the NBA or even the NBA Development League. But, you know, isn't it more lucrative playing in the States? I, I would think that it would be. Maybe not. You know, it is because the NBA is remains the gold standard of professional basketball around the world. So, of course, on on average, it's better to play in the States. But there's only about 400-odd NBA basketball players. So the odds of hitting that are kind of like hitting the lottery in a way. So if you want to have better odds, you know, when you play the lottery, if you play the great big game, the odds are high. And if you play a game that pays you less money, the odds are not as high and you're more likely to win. So it's kind of like that. Uh, if you don't make the NBA... I'm sure you're not going to make the NBA salary, but there are very respectable salaries to be made in professional basketball overseas. And and so do you just deal with basketball only or other sports? Well, currently I'm a certified agent for FIBA, which is the International Basketball Federation. We we eventually plan to expand our agency into other sports. I know that some agents say, well, now you've got you to specialize in one sport. 
you know, that's kind of like saying as a lawyer, you have to specialize in one thing. Uh, I've worked around the world as a number of things, and I think that I can handle uh, hockey and basketball and, you know, maybe football as well. So it really all boils down to, to contracts uh, is the heart of it. And so uh, contracts is, you know, it's what I've done for a long time. Right, right. And so where do these, let's take basketball, for example, where do uh, the players typically go? Are there probably a few sort of hot choices, I assume, in terms of countries? Well, there are hot choices because there are leagues that are more competitive and therefore higher pay. For example, if you're not going to be in the NBA, you might want to be in a, a pro A level team in Europe, for example. France, the pro A league is a very a league with very competitive players. We've actually had some French players come into the United States. Tony Parker, for example, played in the pro A league before. And so that's a pretty high level of play. If you're a good good player, uh, you'll get a decent salary. That's France, uh, Spain, and Italy uh, have very competitive leagues. Germany has a competitive league, and again, all these leagues have, you know, a top level league, and then a mid level league, and then a lower level league. So there's really room for all different levels of players. There are also very competitive leagues in Greece. Serbia is a huge market for basketball. Fans over in Serbia love basketball. Turkey is a, an interesting market for basketball, also potential for a very high salary. For example, I understand that uh, Allen Iverson, when he retired from the Philadelphia 76ers, went and played in uh, Turkey for a couple of years, and he was drawing seven-figure salaries in Turkey. So seven seven figures, yeah, that's that's good. Now, what what else do the players have to deal with? What about tax considerations? I, I assume that some of their income is not taxable in the U.S., maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand, depending on their single or married. I assume. Well, without getting in too into the technical details, there actually is a um, an exoneration of taxes for U.S. citizens who who work a full year abroad. Most basketball seasons don't last a full year, so it's likely that the player will not spend the entire year abroad playing. But there are leagues, for example, in Paraguay, that they don't take a break. They, they just play all year all year long. But that is uh, one way. Another way that sometimes uh, for the shorter periods when, when taxes might be uh, liable or might, might be payable, uh, sometimes teams, for example, over in Europe offer to pay the local taxes as part of the remuneration to the player which can also include sometimes lodging, the use of a car, can even include meals at times. So there's uh, other benefits besides just the salary. And what about the sort of the, when talking about other benefits, is there a um, a celebrity benefit and, you know, I guess interpret celebrity benefit <laughs> however you want, but is it more than they would have in terms of celebrity benefit in the U.S.? I guess what I mean by that is these are players that wouldn't necessarily make it into the NBA, as you mentioned, right? So right. They're, not, they're, they're not at that level. But being from another country, is it more exotic? These leagues aren't quite as high-end as the NBA. So how does that play out? Well, let me just first say I, I, I kind of agreed a little bit, but maybe half-heartedly, that some of the players are very competitive, uh, even even by NBA standards, so I wouldn't say that uh, you know you're playing in Europe just because you're not NBA. You can play in Europe for other reasons, and as I say, some of the top European leagues have very competitive players, some of whom do come and play in the NBA. Sure. But as far as the uh, the celebrity advantage, you know, if you have a choice to play in uh, Europe on a Pro A or even a Pro B team or the NBA D League, I think you're going to have a little bit more of a celebrity advantage when you're playing on the Pro A or Pro B team in Europe than in the NBA D League here in the United States. And you're more likely to make you're likely to make more money as well. I think there is a certain uh, exoticness to uh, foreigners. Sometimes foreigners become very famous just for that. And uh, I'm not talking about the basketball context, but just generally in Japan, for example, Many foreigners are celebrities. And not, you know, it's kind of like when you're not even sure why they're celebrities, and we have some people like that in this country. But in Japan, uh, you know, if you're non-Japanese and you can speak Japanese, that's that's probably reason enough to put you on television. So, <laughs> right. so there is a certain celebrity advantage to to being a foreigner in some markets. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Good. Good. Well, what else should people know about this? Well, uh, what they should know is that uh, basketball is, uh, I guess, maybe not the best kept secret, but it's it's a huge world phenomenon. Of course, it was invented here in North America by Dr. James Naismith, but uh, it's taken over the world, really. 
And, you know, we, we, we talked about the theme of, of Jet Setter. That is, uh, you know, for basketball fans who are Jet Setters, you can enjoy basketball at a professional level all over the world. Now, it won't be always the same professional level, but it will always be exciting and entertaining. Many countries have American players playing. You can root for your for your home players. Uh, you can root for countries that you like. Maybe you have uh, the, the background of descendancy from that country. So it uh, really makes for an interesting adventure. Uh, it has been a great adventure for me. Um, you know, I travel around the world a lot, and uh, as a as a sports agent, I now add basketball to my agenda literally everywhere I go. And that gives you some nice tax benefits as well, I assume. <laughs> it does, of course, yeah. it does. The, the traveling itself, obviously, is you know something that becomes necessary as part of business. Sure, absolutely. But uh, it makes makes it for a lot of fun as well. It's yeah. Fun. Not mere drudgery of travel. It's something exciting to look forward to every time you get on the plane. Right, right, right. Which countries are the best at it? I mean, I, I know that you said that some of these players are very competitive and, and really at NBA level, even though they're playing overseas. What countries would you say really shine outside of the U.S. in, in terms of the excitement of the game, the competitive nature of it, the talent of the players, etc.? Many of the countries in Europe that we already talked about, uh, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, they have excellent and exciting leagues. But I have to say that uh, a lot of the players from what we sometimes refer to as the former Yugoslavia, now Serbia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, some of those players are great. Some of those fans are uh, tremendous fans. And, you know, we've had um, players from the Balkan regions, whether they're Serbian or Croatian or uh, Bosnian, for many, many years. Um, I don't know if you remember the first uh, American Dream Team back in around 1992, I think it was. The silver medal that year was won by what was then still intact Yugoslavia. And uh, two of the players that were on that silver medal team eventually came over and played in the NBA as well. And we've had, uh, I think, throughout throughout the recent history of the NBA, it seems like there's always somebody from Serbia or Croatia on uh, on some team in, in the NBA. So I think they tend to produce some, some very, very good ball players in that in that region. Good, good. And let's talk a little more generally for a moment, if we can, and just talk about international law and business and property issues. You've dealt with some different cases regarding international property issues. Tell, tell us about some of them, if you would. Well, I've done some pretty interesting and exciting things with property issues. And I guess when we talk about property issues, we're probably really focusing on real property issues. Of course, uh, personal property issues, uh, objects, money, things like that move around the world pretty easily. Land and, and buildings don't move around so easily. Um, and one of the things about land is that uh, it's always going to be subject to the law of where it is. So I've had some interesting adventures, as I said. For example, I've been involved with the sales of real estate in uh, Switzerland, where we went to a notary's office, not really a notary public, a little bit of a higher level legal professional, kind of the way we would go to an attorney here in the United States. And it's interesting because in uh, those jurisdictions, when you have a deed, for example, to sell property, the notary actually reads the entire deed to the parties at their, when they're gathered for the closing. You've probably never seen that done in the United States. But it's kind of a hearkening back to the old days when notaries could read and nobody else could. So they still read the act, and I've had that experience uh, in Switzerland where you know we sat for 45 minutes while uh, the notary read through the entire act uh, of sale for us. I've also been involved in sales, for example, in, um, in the Pacific, in uh, some of the uh, French possessions in the Pacific. I think it was in... Um, New Caledonia, I've done, done real estate work over there, different places, mostly civil law jurisdictions as opposed to common law jurisdictions, or sometimes we refer to as uh, like the, the English, uh, English-speaking countries, they have one way of uh, recording documents and, and organizing property, if you will, differently from the way they do in, in civil law countries. So again, that sort of makes for an interesting adventure every time you get involved in something, because it, uh, even from country to country, the practices can vary even if they are from the same system. You know, just like we see here that uh, in part of English-speaking Canada, they speak the same language, but they don't always do the, the same things in the same way as we do. So it's certainly true of, of other countries where they have a different legal tradition, uh, including the use of this notarial system. Sure, sure. What about, you know, any issues about people having their property confiscated? Americans hear stories like this frequently uh, about Mexico and 
other jurisdictions as well. Any issues like that that you've dealt with, or maybe you weren't personally in the case, but that are interesting for people to know about? You know, I have had a client who lived in Africa, and uh, he had a successful business in Africa, and there was a bit of political turmoil in that particular country. He left. He had two uh, two houses in that country, which which were seized by the government, and uh, there really wasn't a whole lot that we could do about it. Um, it wasn't the kind of uh, expropriation that you see in uh, developed countries where you're, you're likely to get a fair compensation. Uh, I remember studying what we might be able to do to recover these two houses, including uh, even some years after the facts when politics had changed again. But uh, it's, it's, it's a risk that uh, you certainly have to take into account. And I can't tell you that uh, uh, we came out on the right side of it. I don't think those houses were ever recovered. So that, that's something that uh, people should be mindful of when they're getting involved, particularly in, in, in moving for a long period of time to a, a place that might be uh, not quite familiar. But people being mindful of it, that's great advice. But political turmoil is so far out of the, the bailiwick of most people to really know. I mean, certainly if it's made the news, and I probably think it wouldn't be a good idea to be investing in, in property in Iraq or Afghanistan. <laughs> but, you know, any any more tips on that? You know, that's interesting uh, about the Africa situation you mentioned. You know, there are pl- places that you can look at objectively from afar and say this is a little bit uh, unstable, not quite the level of stability that I would like. And there are places where you can count on greater stability. And again, uh, I think that, for example, if you're if an American is thinking about moving to uh, Western Europe somewhere, somewhere in the European Union, uh, I don't think they're ever going to have a serious issue of expropriation in that way. Confiscation. Expropriation is one thing. Confiscation is something else. If you're compensated for it, it's hard, but you can learn to live with it. If you're not compensated with it, you're never going to forget the experience. The most expensive lesson you'll probably ever learn in life will be that one. <laughs> That's right, it will be. Hopefully nobody ever has to learn it. Well, one last thing for you. You speak several languages, is that correct? I do. How many? You know, it's hard to say because I, I actually add them all the time. Some of them I learn uh, over a period of time and didn't, didn't realize that I was able to speak them as well as I was able to. So, for example, um, currently I'm actually um, studying oh, four or five different languages. None of them is truly new to me. Well, one is, for example, Vietnamese. I was in Vietnam last month. It inspired me to learn the Vietnamese language. When we were in Vietnam, we went to a, uh, a, a business uh, exposition, met a lot of Chinese people there, decided I would learn Chinese as well because they're both tonal languages, and that will help me get used to tonal languages. I'd already studied a few Asian languages in the past. Uh, I'm also working in uh, German to improve it, again, for basketball. Uh, and I'm actually learning the Serbo-Croat language also because of basketball. Wow! So it's uh, it's it's a it's a fun adventure, but it takes a lot of work. Any tips on learning languages? That's very difficult for a lot of people. It is. It is difficult for a lot of people, and I appreciate that. And I, I can't really say that it's easy for me. I work very hard at it. But I would say one tip that I would suggest to to folks is that when you study a foreign language. Try to focus on as many recognizable features as you can. For example, I was just talking over lunch with a fellow from Russia. I was talking about the Serbian language. Serbian is a Slavic language, and I was, you know, we were talking over a little bit of a text, an article about basketball. I said, "Well, you know, see any, any Russian words that you recognize?" And uh, when when you're able to make those connections, you'll be able to remember them, remember them better, and and be able to function with it, with the language better. So try to always be mindful of. Uh, of those similitudes. A lot of people focus on, and they go around the world, and they focus on how different everybody is. Uh, even though I speak many languages, I'm often fascinated about how similar we really all are. Yeah, well, that's that's good advice. That's very good advice. David, give out your website, if you would, and, and tell people where they can learn more about your firm. Sure. I'd like to give out my website, even though it's under construction. It should be uh, uh, debuting pretty soon. But the website is aisports.us. Uh, in the meantime, we also have a Facebook page under AI Sports. You can check it out, like the page. I hope you will. We also have an email if you want to contact with me or directly any players interested in uh, maybe exploring the opportunity of playing overseas. That email is AI Sports 37, AI Sports 37 at gmail.com. Fantastic. Well, David Willig, thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, thanks for the opportunity to be with you. It's been great, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to doing it again sometime.
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.